Hello YouTube and welcome to the next episode in my Timeline of Emperor series. The Remen Dynasty. Or Remen Dynasty. I'll keep it as Remen. I've been working on this video uh, and the Cyrodiil video simultaneously. But the Cyrodiil video has cost a lot more time and effort to make. And it's now nearing its completion. It's scheduled for release early next week or late this week. Depending on how fast the people aiding me are responding. I promise to upload it whenever it's ready. <laughs> so that said. This video will be uh, kind of simplified since there is a lot to say about all, about the entire period that I'm covering and there's seriously a lot, a lot of ground to cover. So without further ado, let's just quickly kick off. So, the Riemann dynasty. The first and foremost misconception that people have about the Riemann dynasty is that people think that Riemann was the last name of the Emperor dynasty, like the Mede and Septim dynasty. However, this is not true. The last name of the dynasty of emperors was Cyrodiil. They were, they were named after the province of Cyrodiil. So the first emperor was Riemann Cyrodiil. Riemann was his first name and Cyrodiil was the last name. It's called the Riemann dynasty probably to avoid misconceptions about the province. Anyway, the Riemann dynasty officially reigned only during uh, the end of the first era, with the first era ending when the Riemann line officially ended. However, the empire itself, or the second empire, was later continued by the Akaviri potentates. In total, the second empire reigned for, for six, 647 years, with the Riemann emperors reigning over the first seven, uh, 217 years and the other 430 years being under the rule of the Akaviri potentates. After the ending of the Akavir potentate reign came a period called the Interregnum. This little over 400 year period saw the events of Elder Scrolls Online in the year 583 of the Second Era. This is 153 years after the fall of the Riemann Empire. This means that we can safely say that the imperial flags we see in the Elder Scrolls Online are in fact the flag of the Riemann Empire and that, all, that the other imperial things like camps, armor and structures also have great influence from the Second Empire or the Riemann Empire. Anyway, during the Interregnum the uh, Empire lost a significant amount of influence and was under the rule of a lot of short-lived emperors. And basically all international trade fell apart, roads and structures had fallen completely apart and only the new Septim Empire would rebuild them eventually. During this period there was a lot of petty emperors, like all the emperors we have in Elder Scrolls Online, basically 50% of the players. With the most notable <laughs> emperors being the Longhouse Emperors before Elder Scrolls Online. A dynasty of emperors that was reportedly half imperial, half reachmen. They were the ones trying to, re to revive the Second Empire with their, din with their dynasty shortly before the Elder Scrolls Online. I will also shortly touch on them for this video because uh, with them all the structure that still remained of the Second Empire and all hope for the revival of the Second Empire fell when it was overthrown by Warlord Ferdinand and Aquila Aquilarius or the Prophet as we know him in Elder Scrolls Online. So let's start with the history of the Riemann Emperors, since they will be the main focus of this video. The first of them was Riemann I Cyrodiil, or just Riemann Cyrodiil. In short, Riemann Cyrodiil I is the greatest hero of mankind of the late First Era. He was the founder of the, Se of the Second um, Imperial Empire, and it was one of the biggest empires in the history of Tamriel, only rivaled by that of Tiber Septim because Septim managed to conquer all of Tamriel and the combined Riemann uh, dynasty did just that except for Morrowind and Somerset. He has turned into a Tiber Septim-like figure for the people of the late First Era and Second Era since he was worshipped uh, as a hero god by the humans of Tamriel. He was the one that chose the name Cyrodiil for his dynasty. Due to him being worshipped there, there are a lot of legends to, to, that are in circulation as to his birth. With one, of the, with one legend telling of him being born to the spirit of Saint Alessia and the Colovian king, King Hrol, on a large hill that is now Sankrator, the ruined fort we see in Oblivion, and it is the final resting place of the Riemann emperors. This legend also tells that when, the, when uh, Riemann the first was born, he had the amulet of kings embedded in his head, which had been lost before. Either if this legend is true or not, he had the amulet of kings, which gave him a chance to rise within society and he ultimately became a leader of Cyrodiil. 
When the uh, Akaviri invaded during the late first era, Riemann used, uh, used this as a means to unite a lot of the human factions under his banner. Cyrodiil, Skyrim and parts of High Rock and parts of Hammerfell were then under his command. He had first united Cyrodiil by uniting Nibene and Colovia under his banner and after that united most of the hum other human territories against the Akaviri invaders. He managed to crushingly defeat the invaders at Pill Pass. However, the Ekaviri who had been searching for a dragonborn realized that Hiremon was dragonborn after their defeat and then swore fealty to him and, pro and proclaimed, proclaimed him the true emperor. Riemann himself, however, never took the throne, remaining with the title of king until the last of his days. Some of the stronger Ekaviri that swore fealty to him became the first blades or the dragon guard. They were charged with the protection of the rulers, in particular the Dragonborn rulers. The name Dragon Guard actually comes from Ekavir, where the Dragon Guard were the ones tasked with the killing of dragons. They became the Riemann Dynasty Sworn Guards, retaining the name Dragon Guard for the entirety of the Riemann Dynasty, getting the name Blades somewhere between the end of the First Era and the start of the Septim Dynasty. He also remade the border between Skyrim and High Rock, dividing the Reachmen that lived there in the Reach so they could no longer ally against him. He also in introduced them to the economy of the Empire, so they, would get, uh, so they wouldn't be stuck in their primitive economy of, I don't know, sheeps. He then turned his attention to Valenwood, which had been very much weakened by the Thracian Plague. This put him to, into the position to quickly take Valenwood, and the Cameron dynasty of Valenwood was quickly disposed of, and Valenwood was divided into several governmental regions that, were, that all were pretty much autonomous. In this way, they, uh, he would make sure there was enough internal strife so they could never ally against him. So basically what we see now is him just trying to pick off his enemies so they, can, so they can't put him out of his place as emperor. During his lifetime he managed to get imperial influence in all imperial provinces with slight mixtures of Akaviri culture due to the Dragon Guard and due to his potentate being an, an Akavir. This in fact is still the imperial culture we see in the Septim and Mede empires. Also part of his cultural reforms was the establishment of how one could become emperor. He established all the rights needed and recreated the ritual with the Amulet of Kings. So this could all be a formal occasion instead of someone just bashing into Cyrodiil and claiming himself to be emperor. When he finally died in the year 2762 of the first era he was buried in San Crator after doing much good for the provinces and incorporated in the empire by stimulating culture, trade and build a lot of forts. For example, the, the most of the forts we see in Skyrim, so forts like Fort Kastav, Fort uh, Thingy near Whiterun, I don't know the name, <laughs> we, uh, they were all built by him, uh, mainly to combat the Akaviri invaders. Rimmon I was then after his death succeeded by Emperor Kastav Cyril, his son. And so now we also know what the fort in Winterhold is named after. We know, we know not that much about Kastav's reign, but what we do know, I, I will tell you. Kastav was the first one of the Cyrodiil line to actually take the title of Emperor. It is known that he was quite incompetent in comparison to the other Remans and his father. He was also responsible for bringing House Tharn to the province by, uh, by employing Exhoraglas Tharn as a close associate. Sorry for my pronunciation of Elder Scrolls names. Uh, earlier subscribers know that I am not really that good at it. <laughs> so Emperor Kastav was known to force the imperial provinces into cooperation. For example, when he needed men for his armies or needed money for taxes, he just sent the, Gren the Dragon Guard to capture some peasants for his army or just to sack a city for the, for the gold. The Dragon Guard itself grew quite uneasy with this and often objected to his requests, but usually cooperated when Kastav insisted, since they had sworn fealty to the Riemann dynasty. In the year 2804 of the First Era, the city of Winterhold started rebelling against these policies, and when Kastav wanted the Dragon Guard to exterminate the rebels, the masters of the Skyrim Dragon Guard, housed at Skyhaven Temple, simply refused it, because they, wouldn't, they would no longer cooperate with him. This caused Kastav to besiege the Skyhaven Temple, uh, the residence of the Skyrim Dragon Guard, and have some less honorable Dragon Guard members that have had been. And I, I don't really. It isn't really clear if the if the guy he sent was actually a Dragon Guard a person or someone who was uh, fired from the Dragon Guard. But he had him sack uh, Winterhold together with an uh, Imperial Army, which gave the Nords the impression that the Skyrim Dragon Guard were actually involved in the conflict, something that 
will significantly lower the reputation of the Dragon Guard in Skyrim. However, after this political uh, clusterfuck <laughs> sparked by Kastav, he was under mysterious circumstances disposed of and replaced by Emperor Raymond Cyrodiil II. Re Emperor Raymond Cyrodiil II was a good man and a good emperor. Under his rule, the Empire experienced the Golden Age, starting when he negotiated the peace with Winterhold rebels. He made sure that imperial influence and culture once again had time to grow within the imperial territories and undid the mistakes of Emperor Kastav. He also started the conquest of Argonia, a war that is very detailed in lore and that I plan to do a video on, just like my Great War video, in the future. If I, uh, if I have already done it by the time you are watching this video, I'll make sure to put it in the eye icon right now. But at the time I'm making it, I haven't done it yet, so yeah. Anyway, the war shortly summarized is that there were a few conquests into Black Marsh, or at that time Argonia. The first one was not at all that successful. The Elder Council then decided to again try and invade Argonia, not to lose face. This advance also halted at one point, but was again renewed with new troops by Riemann the second in his own decision this time, instead of the Elder Council being the deciding factor. This had some success, but at one point devolved into a guerrilla war. Well, long story short, a lot of shit happened and then suddenly all the Argonians went back to home and, well, the empire was victorious. Riemann II named the province Black Marsh instead of Argonia, or the imperial province of Black Marsh. By this victory, Riemann II had gained a lot of confidence and he decided to attack Morwind as well. This would turn out very devastating and it, was, and it came to be known as the Four Score War. A war that resulted into Riemann's death, but would also keep going under all his successors. This war caused for the Empire's resources to be heavily drained and brought an end to the Riemann Golden Age that Riemann II had worked on so hard. Riemann II was after that succeeded by Brazolus Dor Cyrodiil, a quite incompetent leader. He continued to wage the war against Morrowind and bravely fought in it himself, as he was well, quite the military commander. But he was quite incompetent for foreign, po for domestic policy, I mean, and left m uh, most of the political internal business to his potentate, his Akaviri potentate, while he either fought in the war or resided in his vacation palace wh uh, while the war raged on. After his death, Brazolus Dor Cyrodiil was succeeded by the last of the Riemann emperors, Riemann Cyrodiil III. Emperor Riemann Cyrodiil III was heir to Brazolus Dor, and he too would continue in the war in Morrowind, that, would be, that had begun by his grandfather. Riemann III was believed to have sort of constant paranoia, trusting only the people that are very close to him. It's likely that Riemann III's paranoia was actually caused by the betrayal of his wife early during his reign. Well, his reign actually ended in the last year of the, second, uh, of the first era. Emperor Riemann III led his armies from the rear to make certain that he would not die in battle in Morrowind. However, in this year, after, suffer after suffering a crushing defeat at the border, Riemann III was forced into retreat, an army back to Cyrodiil. However, Riemann III's son, Prince Julik, I, I don't know if it's right pronounced, managed to achieve an important strategic victory at the stronghold of Alt Marak, turning the tide of the war in the Empire's favor. This caused Vivek, one of Morrowind's uh, three living gods, to meet with, uh, with the prince to sue for peace. It was eventually agreed to that Morrowind would surrender its coastline, as well as some other things. In return, the empire would cease all hostilities against Morrowind and allow the nation to expand some territories into Black Marsh in areas that the empire found, well, not worthy to their own. For example, this piece that's just filled with swamp and nothing else. However, this treaty would be postponed multiple times, as then the assassination of Prince Julik uh, took place. It was eventually decided that Riemann III himself would this time sign the treaty due to the death of his son, this time at the White Gold Tower, where he would meet with Vivek. However, before the treaty could be signed, Riemann III's paranoia was proven correct and he was assassinated by an associate of the Morak Tong. Many think that this assassin was sent by Versidu Shei. I hope that I pronounced it correctly. The Akaviri potentate of Riemann III. As Riemann III died with no living heirs, trouble ensued over who would, who would succeed him. The Elder Council refused to acknowledge the claims of the dynasty's distant cousins and instead installed Versidus Shea 
the acting ruler of the emperor or F of the empire or the Ekaviri potentate. The potentate's first ask was honoring the emperor's treaty. He met Vivek and finally brought an end to the grievous four score war. Due to its failure to protect the Riemann III, the Dragon Guard was officially disbanded since the Riemann line was now broken. And the Amulet of Kings was then buried with Riemann III at Sancrator and would be lost for many generations. At first to his public inauguration, he pronounced the, with the fall of the Riemann dynasty a new era would begin, thus entering the first year of the Second Era. This marked the beginning of the reign of the potentates over the Second Empire. It actually began with a lot of turmoil because a lot of sources tell us that the death of Riemann III and the loss of the Dragonborn line would bring about the prophesied doom of the world because there was no longer someone to carry the Amulet of Kings. But eventually the reign of the potentate was accepted and during the Second Empire's time there have been two Ekaviri potentates that together ruled over the Second Empire for 430 years. The first one being first to do Shea. Again, sorry for my pronunciation. First to Shea actually managed to sort of keep the empire together for a long time, but slowly in his first 200 years or so, the empire started falling apart. We know, that nearly, we know nearly nothing of this time of falling apart before other than he reinstated the dragon guard and used them as an intelligence agency instead of bodyguards, a bit like the meat empire is using the Penitus Occulatus. The reason the Ekaviri Dragon Guard actually listened to Versidu's commands is because Versidu was one of the sons of the original commander of the Ekaviri invasion the, during the First Era. That was stopped by Riemann Cyrodiil. He also during this time constructed the most notorious prison in Tamriel, the, the Rose as it's called, in the ruins of the city of Black Rose. However, we know that during the year 283 of the Second Era, the Empire had actually almost collapsed. Nothing that First Duché could do could actually stop it. The kingdoms under the rule of the Potentate had actually stopped listening to his excessive commands and were actually in open rebellion against him. Sometimes even taking up arms against the Imperial institutions. However, a great defeat in Skyrim caused First Duché to declare martial law in Tamriel. He demanded that every citizen and lord within the empire would cease hostilities or face an annihilation. The next 37 years he would fight a bloody civil war against the lords of Tamriel. And he actually nearly bankrupted and destroyed the empire. But eventually he managed to come up on top and secure the empire's future for a couple of more years. However, by the end of this civil war the empire was almost bankrupt as I said before and completely impoverished. With the land now devoid of local guards and militias, crime escalated severely. And this was something that First Sudu could not effectively combat because he had centralized he had, a, he had centralized a lot of Tamriel and he had just the army that was under his command, but he didn't have like local police. All the all he had was the army. In order to accommodate for this, Dernius Vess, sorry again for the names proposed the creation of a mercenary organization that nobles could hire to stand in for their own personal armies. The Sifin, as they were called, gave the nobility the ability to uphold the law in their realms, where, while also supplying the empire with a steady flow of gold, thus easing two of the potentate's dilemmas, the crisis, the crime, and yeah, those were the two. <laughs> while originally composed of only Tsehsi, uh, the, the, the Sifin eventually became compromised of citizens throughout Tamriel to meet the demands of local geography and politics, as well as made up for the lacking Tseski po population. There was also a general air of suspicion surrounding all the Akaviri Sifim, with many fearing that this was actually an attempt to complete the Tseski Tseski dominance over Tamriel that was started during the first era and stopped by Riemann Cyrodiil. So they thought that Versidu was trying to like give the Akaviri the power over Tamriel but in fact it was only about his own power and he didn't think of his own kind at all. The, at least that's my own theory. theory. The Sifim however made swift, swift progress against the criminal underworlds of Tamriel, quickly becoming a guild spawning the entire empire. The success of the Sifim inspired Potentate First to do to approve of the Guilds Act, thus officially sanctioning many of Tamriel's various guilds including the long distrusted Mage Guild of Somerset. The Sifim was also re-insanctioned, however it was from then on known as the Fighters Guild. 
This creation of official guilds caused for a new economic boost for the empire, again prolonging the empire's existence. While the, potent to, uh, while the potentate first to do had, su had successfully managed to stabilize the crumbling empire, he would not continue his reign for much longer because he was murdered by the Morak Tong again, within his elsewhere palace. This caused, uh, this caused his successor and son, Savirien Chorak, to outlaw the Maya Morak Tong. Severin reigned for li a little over a hundred years that were distincted by the empire falling apart even more while he reacted very poorly to every crisis he faced. One of the bigger mistakes he made was ending the large collective imperial army and allowing all lower lords to once again own their own troops, thereby ending the imperial centralization. He also recognized Orsinium as an imperial province which, ang which angered actually more lords. Eventually he was assassinated together with all his sons and daughters by the Morak Tong, bringing an end to the, uh, to the already crumbling Second Empire. This brought about the in Interregnum, the period in which every petty lord and his pigs tried to claim the ruby throne and rob the Amulet of Kings from Sancrator. With every pretender, imperial influence grew smaller, until only the imperial city and its island were under true imperial control. Even Colovia and Nibene reigned themselves, more or less, and the authority in the provinces was long gone. The most notable of the petty emperors that reigned was a Mine dynasty of emperors called the 6th century empire, or more commonly known as the Longhouse Emperors. It was formed by the Reachman king Durkarak the Black Drake, who conquered Cyrodiil and put himself on the ruby throne. He then married a prominent woman from the Thorn family, who had grown more and more influenced after the end of the Rimmon dynasty, and so tried to legitimize his rule to the, uh, to the empire. He managed to hold on to power for almost 30 or even 40 years, and died in conquest to reclaim Hyrock, slain at the hands of High King Emmerich at the Daggerfall Gates. He was then succeeded by his son, Morikar, whose reign just continued that of his father, but this time not trying to conquer, but consolidate. His reign, however, was short-lived, and we do not know how he died, but somewhere within the 25 years after Dukarak's death, it was the son of Morkahar who, who sat on the throne, Leovic. Leovic was an eccentric ruler. He passed many laws that a lot of people found strange, but he managed to hold on to power. Unfortunately for Emperor Leovic, he managed to make the wrong choice when he was trying to legalize Daedra worship. This caused many Cyrodiilic nobles to openly rebel against him under the lead of Varen Aquilarius, the Duke of Chorl. Varen then took the Imperial City with the help of, high of the High Chancellor Abner Tharn and killed Emperor Leovic in the Imperial Throne Room, ending the Longhouse Dynasty after a little over 70 years of ruling. So, we have reached the last chapter of this long video at last, Varen Aquilarius. The one that would ultimately cause the fall of any hope that the Second Empire would ever be restored. What started so glorious with the Reem and Cyrodiil ended so sadly with Varen. Varen Echolarius was a man with good intentions. He wanted to return to the Second Empire and a, pro and a proper corona coronation with the Amulet of Kings by his side. So he and a group of warriors sent out to find the Amulet and they found it. Varen was promised by his close friend Menamarco that with the Amulet of Kings he could become Dragonborn. However, he was betrayed by Menamarco, and the ritual that had, had, that had to turn him into a Dragonborn caused not for the Dragonfires to be lit, but for his disappearance and the tearing of the barrier between Nern and Oblivion. In the next three years his wife, the daughter of Abner Tharn, Clivia Tharn, tried to keep the Empire together as Empress Regent and even tried to expand the Empire. But the efforts would be futile, and the Empire would collapse due to the invasion of the three great pacts, the Daggerfall Covenant, the Ebonard Pact, and the Altmeri Dominion. Meanwhile, Molek Ball invaded Tamriel as well, and the events of Elder Scrolls Online happened. So, this actually marked the definitive end of the Second Empire. Most people place it at the death of the Akaviri Potentates, but I personally want to put the end of the Second Empire at the events of ESO, because while it was no longer the empire then and there were a lot of pretender rulers the influence of what was once the second empire was still largely there while most of the influence they had uh, that it had would be wiped away by the, by the time the events of ESO ended anyway that was my opinion I mean give your own opinion if you wish however lastly there is something else the Rimmon dynasty has done which is not pinned to a specific emperor so I have left it for last 
According to the Pocket Guide of the Empire, the Riemann dynasty actually had a sort of space program trying to reach Aetherius for some reason. But more information than that, there is not to be found in any of the games. And while I have seen some things online, I couldn't really find anything that has appeared in any of the games. So, really, if anyone knows anything about that, please please put it in the comments. Might might make for an interesting read. I, wish. I hope you liked the video. Anyway, if you if you did, like, subscribe, do all those things. My Instagram and Discord are in the comments for more contact with me. And I hope you liked the video. It was a lot of work and. I must say that it's a shame that I couldn't do the serial video before. Anyway, uh, I want to credit uh, Teslor Illustrations on Tumblr for the nice little uh, timeline I use in this video, like a lot. And uh, I also wish to credit Rebel Size for some of the nice uh, serial pictures. Visit his channel for some more information on an awesome project to revamp Oblivion in Skyrim. Again, his channel is in the description. Yeah, I'll see you all in the next video, which will probably be uh, a smaller video in the middle of the week. And then at the end of the week, there will be the serial video. Finally. <laughs> anyway, and again, I hope you liked it and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.